The singer grinned, tilted his head as true narrators do, struck his fingers on the strings again, and pulled in a deliberately rattling voice. Va a a. With a sword he chops the Yunanavs. Their sword does not take. He pierces them with a spear. Their spear does not take. He swords arrows. Their arrow does not pierce them. The Yunanaeans defeated the Persian warriors Dato and Artifarn. What's this attack? Wa a a. Darius Xerxes, son of Darius, has gone to war against the Huns. If he comes by ship, the ship will be sunk. If he approaches by land, they beat him on land. And if he flies by air, he has no wings. What a nuisance. Neither Artakshatra the first, nor Darius the second, nor the second Artakshatra, nor the third. No matter how many of them lived, Darius and Artakshatras have chewed walnuts. What a nuisance. The singer's eyes narrowed. He squinted at the Persians and bared his teeth merrily, but they grew dimmer and dimmer, and even Bess, who not long ago had been laughing so lightheartedly, now sat with his head tilted like a bull and his jowls moving hard. Only his neighbor, the pale Persian, was still grinning. Whether much time has passed or little, the Persians have no strength at all, the singer spoke again. And if once their army trampled the fields that Yunnan's people had cultivated, nowadays another time has come, and everything is the opposite. Iskender the Two-Horned is marching eastward, and Darius the Third is dragging his feet, but he will hardly carry them far. Bess gloomed, and the prisoner could not bear it, and gritted his teeth. But no one said a word to the singer, and Varahran guessed that the Persians were afraid of this cheerful man with a clear smile and hands as thin as a girl's. And why is it so? The singer threw the stick away. His eyebrows moved to the bridge of his nose, and his face became angry. Why, I ask you, Darya Vushkotoman. He grabbed the captive by the shoulder. Because you all only take, take but do not give. You take gold from us and other peoples. You take cattle, you take people. But you give us nothing in return. Where, when, and who tolerated it, eh? That is why everyone has abandoned you, Darya Bushkotoman, on your hard day and no one will give you a sip of water when your end is near. This is how God has punished the Gahaman clan for their crimes. Enough, Spontamano, shouted Bess. Have you forgotten that I, too, your friend, come from this family? The singer turned away silently. Spontamano, he exclaimed and sprang from his hiding place. Forgetting his bag, he rushed toward the fire. The travelers looked at him in surprise, as if he had fallen from the sky. Who are you? Spontamano asked discreetly. Varahran, son of Frada. Do you remember the old Chaser Frada? Our establishment stands to the left of the south gate of Maraconda. You used to come and watch your father make patterns on silver dishes. I am Varahran. Varahran! Spantamano, perk it up. But how did you get here? Perseance. Varahran clenched his fist. No one take his goods. My father owes money all around. No money to pay the tax. The Perseans wanted to take away the workshop. And what would happen if they did? The whole family would be ruined. So I took pity on my father. I became a slave. For three years, while you were at war, I languished in Rega, cursed Rega, working for the governor of the city. I thought I'd never see Maraconda or old Frada again. But Oramazda helped me. When Zulkarnain took Iigbatana, my master was almost frightened. A commotion arose, the supervision of the slaves was weakened. 
I did not hesitate and left this filthy city, where in three years I shed as many tears as another man would not cry in thirty years. Do you see how I am now? I shall never be the Mary Varahran you saw before. The journey through mountains and deserts has taken the last of my strength. Hunger torments me. If you don't take this poor chaser under your hand, I'll be lost. Don't be afraid, Spantamano smiled. I'm taking you with me. You will sit on my second horse. God willing, we shall see our native Maracanda again and drink wine from the bowls made by your father's skillful hand. May it be good for you and your kin. May Oramazda not send you bad luck. Yes. All right, all right, Spantamano interrupted him. I have had enough of blessings. You will wish for so many of them that I cannot carry them. You better take a look at this. What's hanging over the fire? A cauldron. What's in the cauldron? Broth. That's what we're going to taste now. Hey, get the dishes out. But Spontamano and his companions didn't get to taste the broth. An Iranian on a rearing horse suddenly appeared from over the hillock. His mouth twisted in horror. He rushed past, defending one word as he went. Iskender. If a stone had been thrown at a flock of peacefully slumbering pigeons, they would not have scattered so hastily as the Persians and Sogdians scattered from the fires. The warriors caught the horses and with shaking hands removed the fetters. The fugitives were so frightened that their fingers did not obey. Knots could not be untied. Girths could not be tightened. The animals, sensing the excitement of their masters, beat their hooves into the ground and reared up on their haunches. The warriors scolded in a fierce whisper, as if they were afraid that Zulkarnine himself might hear them. Only Spontamano was already sitting on his horse and shouting, baring his teeth, Pepper! Where is the Pepper? What do you want Pepper for? Bess asked, running past. Under the horse's tails, they'll rush like the wind. Dog! Bess cursed as he climbed on his horse. At last the fugitives gathered themselves together. Hooves clattered. The wheels of the wagons rumbled. After riding nearly half a parsing, Spantamano noticed that Bess had fallen behind. The king and Bess's closest friends were also absent from the crowd of fugitives. They'll kill him! exclaimed the Sogdian and turned his horse. You're too late! Bess gloatingly threw to him, rushing past. It's all over. Spantamano sped after him. He wanted to shout something, but he thought nothing of it, grinned, and waved his hand sluggishly. A minute later, there was almost no one left near the drying lake. When the detachment of Giter broke out from behind the red hillock, the Macedonians saw only a tiny Persian sobbing over the corpse of an unknown man. Nearby, in a cauldron over the fire, liquid broth was bubbling and overflowing over the edge. No one had touched it. Farno! Ptolemaios Lag called, holding his horse back. Find out who it is. Who are you? asked the Persian, a nasal warrior in Asiatic dress, Elysian by birth. I am a poor man. My name will tell you nothing, sir, he replied sadly, wiping his blinking eyes with his dirty fists. And who is he? He is nobody now, the Persian answered humbly. But four years ago he was called the King of Kings and ruled half the world. Kodoman is killed, Alexander, Ptolemaios informed the king. What? Dareios has been killed? Yes. Who killed him? Nabarzan the Thousand and Barzantes, satrap of Drangiana. They acted at the instigation of Bessus, ruler of Bactra and Sogdiana. Bess? Oh, damn him. Who else was with him? A Sogdian of noble birth. His name is Speth. Spint. Spiderman. 
Spiderman, I think. I can't make them out, those barbarian names. Spiderman? Who is he? They say he's a curious man, something like our Diogenes. Remember we saw him at Corinth? He was lying in front of his clay barrel, warming himself. You talked to him for a long time. Then you asked him, Is there anything I can do for you? Sure, he replied. Here, stand back a little and don't block my son. Remember, it was. Well, this Spiderman too, they say, is a bit of a maverick. Wanderer, wit, walks around in holy leopard skins and nobody's afraid. Nobody's afraid, so they say. What's going to happen next? They also say he's a descendant of Siavaksh, the ancient Sogdian king, whose name is sacred. Well, well, tell me. Siavaksh is associated with the cult of the sun. That's why, they say, Spitaman has golden hair, like you, Lag wanted to say, redheads, but did not dare. Spitaman's clan is honored and famous in Sogdiana. Hmm. Yes, that's curious. Was Speederman involved in the murder? No, but he didn't prevent it. According to the captured slave, Speederman rejoices in the fall of Kodoman. He sings like a child when others weep. So, what is he, young, old? He's 25 years old. A year younger than me. Yes. All right, remember his name. Maybe I can use him, but Bess. Oh, you bastard. He has snatched from my hands the prey I have dreamed of for four years. Iliad, who lifts a young deer from the den and drives it over the mountains, rushes after it through bushes and ravines, and even if it hides in fear, crouches under a bush, watches and runs tirelessly until it is found. For four years, Dareos had eluded me and now, when he was about to be caught, oh, that Bess! I wanted Kodoman himself to lay his crown on my head. Do you understand? I understand. Then all of Asia would recognize me as the rightful ruler. Is that clear? I see. And the barbarians would make less noise than they do now, wouldn't they? Yes. But Bess got in my way. Damn him, three times over. Why do you think he killed the king? He must want to be ruler of Persia himself. He's also of Akiman's family, a kinsman of Dareos, a good kinsman. But he will not rule Asia by the spirit of my father Philip. Since Dareos is dead, I declare myself Alexander, son of the god Ammon, lord of the east. In the morning, a great council of the Geters the king's comrades, was held in the Macedonians' camp. They gathered to proclaim Alexander as the ruler of the Iranian power. On the occasion, the Macedonians changed their cloaks and chitons, but they did not make themselves any more handsome. Tanned, weathered faces and thickly grown beards made them look like brigands of the mountains. Today, everything amazed them. Alexander sat on a gentle hill with his legs tucked up in the barbaric fashion. An Asiatic carpet lay heavy beneath him. Asian incense was smoking in bronze Asian altars in front of him. Around him crowded the Asiatics. Artabaz, the satrap of Darius, who had gone into the service of the Macedonians, and his son Cothenes. Atropatos, who had fought at Gavgamela against Alexander, and having been captured, had become the faithful servant of the Macedonian king and his viceroys in the country of the Midians. Abulit, the ruler of Susiana, the Lycian Farnuch, Maseus, who had surrendered Babylon to the Macedonians without a fight, his children Gidarn and Artibulus, and the Persian Pevkest. They spoke bravely in Persian. One could only hear Iskander, Jan, Bustan, Dastan, Lulistan. And Alexander listened to them with undisguised pleasure. 
He seemed to like their long stately beards, their spacious clothes, their cheeks, and painted lips. The Asiatics discreetly pushed it away from the king as fellow Macedonians, and even Cletus, Alexander's milk brother, who had saved his life at Granicus, sat aside with a dejected look. This unpleasantly surprised the Macedonians, but even more distressing to them was what Ptolemaios Ligus said when he opened the council. Since Doreos Codomanus has been killed by his kinsman Bessus, Ptolemaios announced, and Asia has lost its ruler, then from now on Alexander, the son of the god Ammon, becomes the ruler of this country by right. Let us give him the honors that are befitting a king of the East. Henceforth, no one shall address the ruler of the world as if he were his equal. Let us kneel before the son of the god Ammon, ruler of the lands from sunrise to sunset. And Ptolemaeus Lagus was the first to kneel down, committing an act unheard of in Hellas. The Geters were stunned. Young, fair-haired, blue-eyed Clytus, long and pale Koinos, Parmenion's son-in-law, gray-haired Parmenion, his gloomy son Philotas, and Pion Aminta, son of Arabaeus, astonished at Lagus's words and actions, did not move from their seats. But Hephaestion, Alexander's friend, and the Asiatics eagerly joined Ptolemaios Lagus, and the formidable Ferdica, with both hands raised above Alexander's head, the three-tiered crown of Darius, captured at Ecbatana. The rays of the sun played merrily on the golden plates and multicolored stones of the decoration. The glare of the crown fell on the bodyguard's face, and he seemed to be holding a heavy stone that was red hot. Ferdica squinted, looked sternly at the guitars and waited. Alexander sat with his head slightly pulled back into his shoulders and his head tilted back a little so that his thin neck remained exposed and gazed silently to the east. His face was completely impassive, as if he did not notice his surroundings at all. Only a vein beating sharply on his temple spoke of the inner tension the king was feeling. The Gataeers hesitated, so Ferdica stepped forward. Angry, slouching, hook-nosed, furry eyebrows furrowed, and his face skewed, he cast such a penetrating glance that everyone lowered his eyes. Yes, the Macedonians had lost much today. Alexander is no longer the young man he was when he went to the east. And if they do not do as Ptolemaeus demands of them, they will be in trouble. Hail Alexander, Bellowood for Dicca, and the thousands of Gatiris, Phalangidis, foot and mounted soldiers surrounding the hill fell to their knees and struck their foreheads on the ground. The bulging backs of the armor-bound men glistened. It seemed that the whole field was suddenly dotted with the scattering of oblong boulders. The horns sang menacingly. The sounds of kettle drums, cymbals, and flutes were heard. The hairy peons and fur-clad agrians drew their curved swords and whirled about, glittering with wild eyes in a measured warlike dance. Slaves brought amphorae and bellows of strong Asian wine. A feast began. The drunken Jeters began to think that Alexander was right, as always, and that everything he did not do was for their own good. After all, it's sublime to kneel before a king. Alexander deserves to be honored. And the soldiers of the middle and especially light infantry did not care about everything. They were glad that they could rest and eat enough today. Only Philotas, the son of Parmenion, who remained in Ecbatana, and three or four of his henchmen could not reconcile themselves to the new orders. How he, Philotas, the son of the famous Parmenion, a man who himself could have become a king no worse than Alexander, 
should he lick someone's heels like a barbarian? The horror made the serpent swallow this Alexander. That's what the violent tendencies of his childhood have degenerated into. All under himself became not Macedonian king, but Persian. Soon he will completely turn into an Asian, will make loyal friends among the Persians, and Parmenion, Philotas, and other high-ranking Macedonians where to the scrap heap? No, that cannot be allowed. Seated in the thickets of wild elk, I cannot see this horned Devo, said Philotas in his heart, and put out centuries of loyal men. The conspirators held a council how to get rid of Alexander. Philotas, heated with envy and anger, drank wine in the Scythian way, without diluting it with water and the hop quickly hit him in the head. Philoda spoke perhaps too loudly, and at the end he became quite mad, beating himself with his fist and shouting furiously. How could he know that under the bush of a sucker bush, three steps away from the sweetly snoring sentinel, if commanders drink, why not a soldier, lurked a certain Drakil, a merchant from Marathon, Alexander languished in the tent, wrapping his arms around his knees and resting his head on them. His body was relaxed, the muscles of his naked arms, deprived of their usual tension, softened and swelled slightly downwards. The ruler of forty countries looked like a woman thinking about her unfortunate fate. The marathoner's denunciation embarrassed Alexander. Philotas had decided to kill him. Yes, that wasn't the babble of some Theogenes. Alexander was afraid, afraid for the first time in his life, though he did not want to admit it to himself. It was not fear for his head, which, if the conspiracy had not been uncovered, would have been severed from his torso with a blow of a sharp sword. It was fear for the dreams in that head. They stretched to incredible limits. India and China, Scythia and the Caucasus, then the countries lying on the western shores of the Mediterranean Sea, to be ruler of the world. Yes, to be ruler of the world. For what? For gold? Gold makes life easy and carefree, but you don't need much of it. Alexander has treasure enough. And if it were anyone else, he'd have given up the campaign long ago and indulged himself. Another, but not Alexander. To strike the imagination of all mankind, to leave a memory for centuries, so that even in a thousand years, in ten thousand years, as long as there is a human race, spoke, wrote, read, and argued about Alexander the Great. This is a dream worthy of a great man. The same dream once lived Cyrus, Darius Hystasi and his son Xerxes, but they could not bring it to completion. Having conquered many countries, they did not win the hearts of the people inhabiting these countries, remained enemies for the conquered peoples, failed to make friends with the rulers of the captured areas. It is necessary to show the barbarians that Iskander Zulfikar IX is their friend and savior liberating Asia from the yoke of the hated kings of Achaemen. Such a move is as necessary as air as light, for Macedonia is far away. Is it possible to rule Asia with only the brainless elders of Pella? It would be like lifting a block with one foot on the edge of a cliff and the other chattering in the void. You'll fall off, thunder kill me as the bald marathon runner says. The support for the second leg should be sought in the east, on the shoulders of Asians of noble descent. The world will submit to Alexander only when Alexander is firmly established on both feet, leaning them on the west and the east. We must mix Hellenes and Asians. It is necessary to make an Athenian in Persepolis and a Persepolite in Athens feel like in their homeland. 
The fusion of hard copper and soft tin produces hard bronze. To fuse the West and the East, to create a new strong nation in the veins of which would flow, merge together, the blood of wise Hellens and dreamy Asians. Only then will it be possible to save from collapse the huge state which Alexander built with the help of his sword. This is why Alexander brings the barbarians closer to him and adopts their customs. But how can Alexander's plans be understood by the feeble brains of such wretched brutes as Philotas? Oh, wretched rabble! Their aspirations extend no farther than troughs and beds. Is man born only to eat, drink, sleep, and breed? Was it for a simple animal existence that Zeus created man in his own image and likeness, and the cunning Prometheus gave him fire? Does not man live for glory, for great deeds, but not everyone is born with a bright head? Are you hungry? Eat, I have given you bread and meat. Are you thirsty? Drink, I have given you wine. Do you want splendid clothes? Put them on, I have given you the fabrics of the East. But no, they will not eat their food and drink their drink in peace. Is there a man who treads the earth differently than they do? Seize him. Beat him. Don't let him do what he's called to do. Oh, cursed people. And it may happen that because of their intrigues, Alexander will not be able to fulfill his God-given dream. What shall we do? Parmenion is not Theogenes. He will not be sent to the Light Infantry under the arrows of Asians. By the way, what became of him? Parmenion was a friend of his father. He is honored by the soldiers. The execution of Parmenion and Philodus will cause confusion but we can't let them go unpunished. They'll kill Alexander. Send them back to Pella. They might revolt there. Where is the solution? Alexander's troubled mind did not suggest any solution. The king sighed sadly. Today, the son of the god Ammon finally realized how lonely he is on Earth, although it belongs to him almost all. He still hadn't come up with anything when Ptolemaios Lagos appeared. Philota has resisted, Ptolemaios reported. Killed three Jeters, wounded Ferdika, insulted you. Oh, Alexander jumped up. Did he? I thought he would repent, but this insolent man shows his teeth. Have you captured him? Where is he? In custody. Keep an eye on him. Double, no, triple the guards. Take his companions into custody. Tell the soldiers that Philodus has made an attempt on the king's life. I'll show you, children of the dust, what Alexander can do. Philip's son has been transformed. Why hesitate? The king was reminded of Thebes when Alexander, barely on the throne, went north against the nomadic Thracians the inhabitants of the sacred city rebelled and declared war on the Macedonians shortly before that conquered Hellas. Did I hesitate then? thought Alexander. No, I swooped down on the Thebans like a comet, turned the city into a heap of ruins, and sold the inhabitants into slavery. The rebellion was eradicated. Yes, I was not afraid to massacre a great city so how can I be afraid of some lousy Parmenion? Announce to the Geteres that the trial of the conspirators will take place tomorrow, he said coldly to Lag. Drakil? The king thought for a while. Transfer Drakil to the troop of mounted bodyguards. This man has done me a second important favor. The trial of Philotas and his accomplices was brief. They were accused of malice against the king and sentenced to death. The criminals, according to custom, were dragged by hooks to the edge of a deep precipice and pushed down on the sharp cliffs without the young king, who was present at the massacre, even moving. 
Then, according to the laws of their ancestors, the Macedonians performed a rite of purification. The priests scattered the entrails of dissected dogs on both sides of the field. The soldiers followed between them troop by troop, maintaining a stern silence. Eleven days later, Alexander's messengers slaughtered old Parmenion at Ecbatano. March through the mountains and thunder's defaining blows roar, and fiery lightnings glisten, and whirlwinds twist the ashes that are blown up. The winds are dancing in a furious dance, and the winds rush toward each other, clashing and clashing, and celebrate the wild and fierce rebellion, heaven and earth mixed into one. Aeschylus, Prometheus chained, the word of Cletarchus. A year and a half had passed since the Battle of Gaugamela. In the middle of the month of Dacion, nine Alexander's troops besieged and took Kabura, a city situated in front of the ridge of the Parpansidi, on the river Kofen, in a basin lying among the mountains. At Kabura, the roads of the four countries of the world meet. It has the best air in the world. Here they sell white cloths, sugarcane, and medicinal plants from the Indians, vessels of strange white clay from the narrow-eyed settled tribes of the East, thousands of bulls and horses. In the vicinity of the city, there is an abyss of orchards, which in the fall abound, as the natives say, with golden apricots, dark red pomegranates, ruddy apples, tart quinces, honey pears, juicy peaches, tender plums, large almonds, selected walnuts, and grapes, the sweeter of which you will not find anywhere. By the river Kofen there are six vast meadows, rich in grass. Here we fatten the horses well, for we have a difficult passage ahead of us. Our way lies to the north, to the famous Bactra. To reach the great capital, we have to cross the terrible pass through the Parpensites. The natives call it the Saddle of Ankraman. No matter how much Ptolemaios Lag persuaded the natives to guide us over the mountains, no one agreed. Even gold didn't help. Then Alexander, suspecting bad intent, ordered to seize ten of the best guides who had traveled with the trade caravan to Bactra more than once and cut off the heads of their elders. The nine who remained immediately relented. Tomorrow we march. O oh, intercessor Hera, goddess of the heights, what awaits us on this hard and dangerous road? Alexander stood motionless on a rock attached to a spur of one of the greatest mountain ranges of the earth and silently contemplated the world. In the west, Iran, trampled by the hooves of Macedonian horses, disappeared in a blue haze, and as if to guess every curve of the countless roads along which, under the protection of Macedonian military posts, slowly crept to Alexander reinforcements from Pella. In the east, the snow-capped peaks of the mysterious mountainous lands, from which there was no return, floated out of the mists. In the north, piles of heavy thunderclouds thickened. In the south, the mysterious India was drowned in a hot golden gloom, Asia. The son of the god Ammon did not know that here in the harsh mountain knot was the cradle of mankind, that from here clenching his club and warily glittering with inquisitive eyes from under low-hanging eyebrows, the wild furred first man descended into the spacious world doused with sunshine, but Alexander's sensitive heart comprehended the immeasurable greatness of the world, and Hellas, nestled somewhere on a narrow peninsula, near the distant sea, seemed to him tiny, pathetic, and ridiculous in comparison with this gigantic scope of bright, full of life spaces. From here, from the heights of heaven, the whole universe opened visibly before him, spread out below, and the son of the god Amon, possessed by a strange feeling, dreamed in reality, raised above the cluster of white clouds. The priest of the Gandhara tribe, 
seated on a stone behind Alexander, touched the strings of his harp. A low, barely audible tinkle sounded. The musicians lightly struck the brass cymbals with their fingers. One of them picked up a tambourine and with two bent fingers tapped on the tightly stretched leather. There. Rarely and measuredly, no quieter and no louder, tambourine under Alexander's ear. There. 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 Long listened to the son of Philip, who climbed the sacred rock to pray before the mountain hike, these smooth, soothing sounds, and gradually his brain as if enveloped in a fog. The beats of the tambourine began to come from afar. Thumb. 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 And then from somewhere in the void, from nothingness, a low, hoarse, lingering sound slowly floated out. A, 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 a. For a long time, a thousand years, a whole eternity, this sound trembled over the rock, ingratiating, intimate, and Alexander felt as if he was falling asleep and breaking away from the ground. The azure sea murmured and murmured. The frothy waves measuredly beat against the shore and rolled back. The pinot branches of palm trees dark blue against the dazzling light sky, are swaying. Temples of snow-white marble glistening in the sun are slumbering over the still water of the pools. And the sound stretches calm, lazy and wise, interrupted only by sighs and unhurried recitative. And the young king sank deeper into his magic dream and saw the milky mist creeping from the gorges and the blue ridges dissolving in the mist, and the gloomy highlands darkened by the shadows falling on them from the giant clouds, and horsetails waving on poles at the silent stone tombs, placed above the cold streams that rumbled on a wide bed of pebbles. The priest sang endlessly, and his voice, quivering with ecstasy, sometimes resembled the breath of the wind. It sounded here and there and everywhere, like a muffled sob or a child's complaint. Occasionally, the cymbals tinkled languidly, and Alexander hovered higher and higher above the world, which gradually melted and turned into a white void. And then everything disappeared, and only a voice was left, coming from nowhere as long as time, and as elusive as a dream. Alexander no longer felt himself, dissipated into a warm void, his heart exclaimed, and he cried with happiness. The next morning, leaving a garrison in Kabur, Alexander marched northward. The road led at first through a wide and friendly valley along a gently babbling river. The sun shone brightly. Flocks of birds chirped loudly and sonorously in the bushes of briar, elk and tamarisk growing along the riverbanks. From afar, it seemed that somewhere they were pouring piles of silver coins from sacks into copper dishes. To the right and left rose rounded hills, covered with beautifully blooming scarlet. Underfoot, the thick growths of trefoil rustled and crunched. The air was unusually clean and fresh, and it seemed as if you were not breathing it in, but drinking it like cold milk. The soldiers rejoiced at the peaceful, fragrant morning. The wrinkles on their stern faces were smoothed by a smile. Light cavalry scouts rode carelessly ahead of the troops, good-naturedly purred under their noses, sitting on mighty horses, heterai. Goplites took off their copper helmets. The warm spring wind stroked their rough cheeks and rubbed their dirty hair without malice. The archers from the Tigris swayed gently on their one-humped camels. The chubby Thracians marched in a noisy bunch. The whips of the carriage servants flicked cheerfully. Someone for fun chose the largest buffalo in the herd, which led behind the army, put a wreath on its horns and drove it ahead. This caused much laughter and joking. 
Without relenting in their stride, the men stooped to the ground, plucked scarlet tulips, and were surprised to notice that their fragrance was similar to that of red roses. The warriors were reminded of Hellas, and the Greeks sighed happily and yet sadly. The Asians even had tears in his eyes. Spring had awakened in him a longing for oxen, for the golden Greek earth, loosened by the plowshares of the plow. The palms of the marathon runner's hands longed for good human work. He looked around him and felt how ridiculous it was that he, a laborer, was walking somewhere far from his homeland through a flowery foreign valley with a gun in his hand. The towering peaks were so out of keeping with the clear smile of nature that Theogenes felt ashamed of himself. He wanted to break his dart and throw it into the stream. Gradually, the hills rose steeper, and the cover of thick grasses was torn by the sharp angles of the protruding rocks. The river murmured louder, and the caress in its voice was replaced by an unkind grumble. Boulders the size of rams began to appear along the banks. The valley narrowed and darkened. The shadow of the rocks fell on the faces of the warriors and extinguished the joy in their eyes. At sunset, the troops stopped and camped on the riverbank, closer to the water. Having satisfied their hunger, the warriors lay down by the extinguished fires, but they could not sleep for a long time. The hour had come when talk subsides and a man is alone with his soul. It was unbearably quiet in the mountains. In the blue-black transparent sky, which smelled of the cold of unknown worlds, the southern stars glittered unbearably bright. And the more a man looked at them, the gloomier he felt. What are the sky, stars, and earth? Why do they exist? From where and where does it all move? In the dark mind of people penetrated a vague sense of the infinite, they gradually embraced the horror of the unsolvable riddle of existence. All began to be oppressed by a sense of doom. The blood of the weak became cold with fear. They groaned, fell to the ground, and prayed pitifully to God. The ardent ones, in order to drown out this fear, jumped up violently from their seats, lit fires again, and drank wine greedily to the point of frenzy. Even the strong ones sadly lowered their heads and sat motionless by the fire, not understanding why it was so hard for them. After crossing the Kofin, the army set off in the morning up the Five Lines River to the northeast. The higher the troops climbed, the more sullen nature became. Instead of gentle knolls, the sides of the river were now blackened with frowning jagged cliffs. The river roared, and the warriors had to shout to hear each other. Huge blocks of limestone shook and rumbled under the pressure of the water, running downward at a speed almost imperceptible to the eye. From the dark gorge where the army crawled like a fabulous serpent into a cave, Wisps of damp darkness flew towards the Macedonians. The sun disappeared. The shivering men, fearful of unknown danger, clutched their spears tighter. The walls of the gorge moved so close that the path on the left bank broke off and continued on the right bank. The warriors of the advance party stopped. The great serpent, which a moment ago, wriggling and shining scales of armor and shields, slowly moved along the path, froze above the stream. The snow was melting in the mountains and the stream was filled with muddy water. The waves growled menacingly and threw themselves under people's feet like shaggy gray dogs. No one dared to be the first to start the crossing. Who knows how deep it is? The king appeared on his black horse. After Kabura, the Macedonians did not recognize their lord. He became even more distant from them, and many were repulsed by the haughty expression on his face. Why did you stop? Alexander asked the chief guide dryly. 
there is no further to go. Cowards! Alexander exclaimed with contempt. We can't go back to Kabura because of this brook, can we? He was so unshakably confident in himself and in the strength of his horse that he did not hesitate and immediately struck the crow with his heels in the sides. The horse reared up and rushed into the stream. The amazed soldiers were splashed with a cascade of spray. Before they knew it, their lord was on the other side of the stream. The raven snorted and shook himself off like a dog. Admiring the king's courage, the warriors rushed after him like a stormy rampart. The great serpent moved forward again. But many new surprises awaited him. The path often crossed then to the left, then to the right bank. The curves of the serpent's body followed it, at once in three or four places, crossing the river aslant. Stones slipped out from under their feet. The warriors fell, and the water dragged and carried them down. Sometimes a rounded boulder came rushing down the river, jumping on the rapids and rapids. Like a cannonball fired from a ballista, it crashed into the ranks of the warriors who were dumb with terror, shattering shells and skulls, breaking bones and tearing bodies to shreds. The trunks of stone-trimmed mountain fir trees struck like battering rams and caused great devastation in the troops. On top of everything suddenly came a large hail and ice flows the size of a pigeon's egg whipped the Macedonians like lead balls thrown from slings. Then the rain came down. The soldiers were soaked from head to toe and shivered with cold and fatigue. Finally, when it became completely dark, the road went away from the river to the left and meandered along the slope of a steep, almost impregnable ridge. The great serpent slowly climbed up the slopes, and the wind-driven flames of two torches, clutched in the hands of the warriors of the advanced detachment, resembled the flickering eyes of the monster. There was no grass or bushes to make fires, to warm and dry themselves. Nor was there any strength to go on. To avoid falling down, the warriors clung to rock ledges and lay on the wet rocks until morning. They were shivering. In response to the convulsive gnashing of teeth and explosions of hoarse coughing, the snarling of the snow leopard sounded from the darkness. Low overhead, on the southern side of the gloomy sky, the star canopus glittered ominously between the clouds. Athena Pallada, grumbled Theogenes, lying in a crevice among the sharp-ribbed rocks. There was no trace of the happy excitement he had felt yesterday morning. The poor man's body was stiff and numb, and only inside, in his heart, was a living spark burning. Theogenes tried to straighten up his members and get the blood pumping through his veins, but he nearly fell off the cliff. This made the Greek furious. What crime did Theogenes commit to endure such torment? The marathoner asked himself angrily. He went over in his mind all his deeds, but found nothing unworthy. He had lived honestly, honestly labored and fed himself and his father. Why does he suffer? Down did not come for a long time. The stiffened men were exhausted from waiting. By morning, everything was covered in fog. It got under their cloaks, clogged their mouths, and left a taste of emptiness and dampness on their tongues. Finally, the icy wind blowing from the snowy peaks dispelled the thick layers of fog, and the great serpent came to life. The guides and scouts went up the trail, and came upon a thicket of mastic tree. Axes clattered. To the joy of the warriors, the mastic tree burned well, even green, and its smoke smelled like incense. The men warmed themselves at the hot fires, dried their cloaks and chitons, and strengthened their strength by roasting bull meat on the long-lasting embers. The army moved towards the saddle of Andraman, 
6,700 cubits above sea level. One turn, a second, tenth, fortieth. Like the curls of a gigantic whirlwind, the curves of the trail looped straight up the steep slope, and it seemed as if there would be no end to them. To the right was the blue dip at the bottom of which the army had passed yesterday. The men ahead of them looked down with apprehension and showed each other with surprise the gray cord that had been thrown by someone on the rocks. Ants were crawling along it. No one believed that the cord was the path they were walking on and that the ants were their companions waddling along. The warriors were filled with a sense of awe at the majesty of the mountains. They looked trustingly at the gnarled, knotty oaks growing in some places, wondering if the evil spirits of the heavenly country were hiding in their windswept crowns. The men were exhausted and lay on the ledge for a long time to catch their breath. The bulls, tired of the unbearably difficult road, fell on their sides with a wheeze and did not get up again. The horses broke off the path and together with the riders flew down the slope shifting the stones from their places, clouds of rubbly and pieces of graniti and gnais avalanche into the valley, sweeping away people and horses from the lower bends of the path. The higher the great serpent climbed, the colder the air became. The wind increased. It blew up clouds of dust and filled the eyes, picked up from the path small fragments of stones and with a swing they cut the noses and cheeks of the Macedonians. The oaks were replaced by sparse groves of juniper trees. A black Himalayan bear ran between the rocks, as if turning out heavy fragments of stone with its crooked paws. In the evening of the sixth day of this unprecedented crossing, when about a hundred meters remained to the saddle of the pass, a huge round stone rolled down the trail with thunder from above. It hit the great serpent in the forehead, crushed his head, collided with a rock ledge, broke off a piece of granite from it, fell over the edge of the trail and rushed down like a meteor, destroying all living things. A triumphant howl was heard above. Dark-faced men in animal skins were cheering and dancing with excitement. The Macedonians froze in place. The mountain dwellers peeled on the second stone. Alexander Sergid forward. The face of the Macedonian became white, like limestone, on which the hooves of his horse pounded. His eyes glittered like a madman's. The mouth curled with anger. The king snatched the slingshot from the hands of the light foot soldier, frozen with fear, and roared, Char! The warrior snatched a lead ball from his bag. Alexander frantically twirled the slingshot, and the ball flew upwards with a whistling sound. One of the Highlanders fell with his head split open. Alexander turned and hit the foot soldier in the face with the leather slingshot. Darmoid! The foot soldiers came to their senses. Arrows, darts, lead and clay, burnt balls flashed. Two or three Highlanders collapsed near a rock they had never managed to move. The rest scattered. The Guterres galloped forward and killed two with their pikes. One was taken alive and dragged to Alexander. He was a tall, swarthy young man. His features were remarkably straight, but the snow leopard skin on his shoulder, the unkind glint of his dark eyes, and the long black hair fluttering in the wind gave the native's face a wild expression. Ask him, Alexander wheezed, clinging to Satrap Artabaz's shoulder. Ask him why he threw the stone at me. Artabaz stepped forward and spoke softly and smoothly in the local language. The Highlander did not answer at once. It seemed to the Macedonians that he was so cruel and feeble-minded that he himself did not know why he had rolled a block of granite on the army. The Highlander, without a shadow of fear, examined the king from head to toe. His gaze stopped on the Macedonian's horned helmet. Is this Zulkarnain? Boldly addressed the Highlander to Artabaz. 
Yes, this is Iskander Zulkanine, Artabaz muttered. He expected that at these words the mountaineer would immediately fall at the feet of the Lord of the World, but the man dressed in animal skins did not blink an eye. His face, unexpectedly for the Macedonians, took on a stern, serious, and intelligent expression, and the conqueror saw that before them was not a savage at all. Ask Zulkanan, he said sullenly to the Persian, ask him why he came to our country. And he stared at Alexander with a deep gaze. That's what he is. Philip's son grinned harshly. Does he want to know why I came here? Very well, I'll tell him. Pevkest. The mountaineer was stripped naked and tied to a rock at the very top of the pass. The Iranian Pevkest, just like Artabaz, who had defected to Alexander's side, took out a small sharp knife and cut the skin on the Highlander's shoulder. The young man guessed what they wanted to do to him, and cowered like an eagle caught in a net. Alexander turned away from the mountaineer and looked north. The vast valley, shrouded in a light yellowish haze, stretched out before him. There it was, the golden Bactriana he had dreamed of since his childhood. The Highlander shrieked, here it is, the treasure land, lying at Alexander's feet, awaiting his coming with trepidation. The Highlander groaned loudly. Here it is, the land of beautiful maidens, bright fabrics, sparkling vessels, the land of hot horses. The Highlander's shrill cries frightened the deer wandering above. One by one, smoothly throwing out their legs, they sped away along the icy rocks and disappeared from sight. Here it is, the country where Alexander's glory will flare up with new force, the country from where he will lead his troops further north into the blue expanses of the legendary Sogdiana. The Highlander choked and fell silent. The Great Serpent slowly crawled down the path to the sacred Bactra. And the young mountaineer, chained to a rock like Prometheus, looked with dead eyes at the warriors of the unknown West, to whom he had done no harm until the West invaded his country with a weapon in his hand. Shreds of torn skin dangled from his crimson body thick streams of steaming blood running onto the cold stones. Theogenes, shuddering at what he had seen and heard today, muttered ominously to himself, You will answer for everything, Alexander. The day will come, and you will answer for everything. Let's go north. Flee from him. He is the foundation of evil. He is Ankraman. He is the enemy of all living things. For Dowsi, the Book of Kings. Alexander was not alone in his quest for sacred Bactra. At that hour, when the Macedonian was still approaching the gates of Kabura, from the west entered the valley of the river band, at which stands Bactra, 3,000 detachment of Bessus. Persians and Sogdians were not many in the detachment, the core of the army was the mounted militia of the docks, nomads living east of the Hyrcanian Sea. Having killed the king, Bess wandered about a year in their camps to recruit an army, and he managed to attract the chiefs of two or three clan communities by means of cunning words. And now they followed him, each with his retinue, frightening the peasants who worked in the fields with the menacing appearance of black, shaggy papas. On sighting Bess and his men, the Bactrian villagers, dressed in tight, tight-fitting chitons and high boots with bent noses, would shoulder heavy round hoes and hastily hide under the protection of dilapidated earthen fences. Why are they hiding? Bess wondered. Do they take me for a Yunnan? The ride through the mountains and desert had worn him out. 
He longed for a spicy, savory brew and dreamed of a shiny, clean mat. Sleeping by the fire and roasting meat over the coals bored him to tears. They probably think you are you, Spantamano muttered with a chuckle. That's why they run, children of the dust. What did you say? The satrap did not hear. I say, these Bactrians are a wicked people. Yes, agreed Bess. I have ruled them for ten years, but I don't remember a single Bactrian who smiled at least once when he saw me. Insolent, Spantamano said in his tone. They're getting ripped off, and they're scowling, the bastards, instead of laughing with joy. Bess could not tell whether the Sogdian was joking or serious, and became angry. He snatched the horse by the reins and galloped silently forward. He wanted to throw something harsh at Spantamano, to humiliate him, to hurt him, to make him mad. But how do you hurt a man? when you can't see the flaw, the sore spot that is so convenient to hurt. It is difficult to pick on Spantamano's words, for it is as if he were only joking, the accursed Sogdian. But one who is not stupid will be able to hear in the supposedly harmless jokes of Siavakshev's offspring the hiss of a poisonous snake, and in his lazy movements will feel the threat. Bess, though superior to Spantamano in height and strength of muscles, often, when the Sogdian looked at him with sly eyes, seemed to himself a helpless gopher hunted by a cunning and patient step fox. There were still two more passages to Bactra. The travelers decided to spend the night somewhere and set out early in the morning to reach the town by Avening. When the sun had set, they came to a village surrounded by a high mud wall. The satrap was stretching with pleasure. He was looking forward to a hearty dinner and resting on a fluffy carpet. But a great disappointment awaited the Persian, for the gates of the village closed with a rumble right in front of his nose. Hey, open up, said Bess in a low, dignified voice and tapped the cloth of the gat carelessly with the hilt of his whip. Where are your eyes? Can't you see who's here? He was Kelm, the villagers having learned that Bess himself, the satrap of Sogdiana and Bactra, had come to them, would hastily open the gates and fall down before the high guest. This was always the case, and Bess was accustomed to accept honors without hesitation, as he was accustomed to drink water when he was thirsty. But the gate would not open. Bess was annoyed. Why do you delay? He exclaimed impatiently. Open it! An old Bactrian with a bow in his hand appeared on the wall. Who are you? He asked angrily. The satrap was confused. He had never been asked who he was. In the palace, when he sat in the golden chair, the nobles bent their backs to him and did not ask who he was. When he rode through the streets, surrounded by a crowd of bodyguards, people bowed to the ground and no one asked who he was. When he was going to visit a county, there were two months of preparations for the meeting and no one asked who he was. Bess is best, damn your father, and now some decrepit, out of his mind, Bactrian. Bess couldn't find anything to say to him, and looked at Spantamano confusedly. He made a menacing face, darted his eyes, and shouted with feigned ferocity, Open quickly, you fool! Do you not see, you son of a dog, that before you is the noblest of Persians, Gahamanides Bessus, your lord? These words made no impression on the old man. Bess? the Bactrian asked in bewilderment. I've never heard of such a man. The Bactrian's stupidity infuriated the satrap. He opened his mouth to hurl a barrage of curses at the old fool, but suddenly he stopped and opened his eyes wide. He realized the old man was faking it. 
Bess had been recognized, of course, and they won't let him into the village precisely because he's Bess. Ah, are you doing this to me? I'll chop them all up. I'll tear down the village. He was squirming on his horse, clenching his fists, baring his teeth and tilting his head like a hungry wolf that sits under a rock in Regas, looking at the deer walking at a safe height. Will you tear down the villagey? The Bactrian frowned. See to it, my son, that you don't get your head blown off by someone. The Persian's face twisted as if from a searing blow. His eyes blurred. He drew his dagger and jerked the reins sharply. The horse reared. Bess swung his dagger desperately, trying to reach the insolent Bactrian. But the wall was twenty cubits high. Bess's hand pulled so hard on the bridle that it nearly snapped the horse's neck. Foolish with pain, the horse made an unimaginable leap in the air and, with a ridiculous kick, fell on its side. Laughter erupted on the wall. Dozens of swarthy, long-bearded men looked out from behind the parapet and laughed at the unlucky jumper. The pig wanted to grab the edge of the moon with his teeth, but he fell back into the muddy puddle, shouted the old Bactrian merrily. Bess, pale with humiliation, slammed his fist on the horse's head. The horse jumped up and galloped away from the gates of the village. Bess's companions turned their horses and followed the leader. Bess was not able to rest that night on the soft carpet, though Spantamano, sparing no throat, shouted at the closed gates of the fortified places, Hey, herd of rustling Bactrian donkeys! Hey, worms not worth even the little finger of the noblest Persian husband Bessus! Why are you sleeping, children of dust? Why don't you run out to meet your good lord? Slaughter the last of the rams, you fools! Bring the wine jars if you have any left. Drag your young daughters by the scythe, you scoundrels. He was clearly inciting the Bactrians against Bessus. The deliberately grievous insults made the peasants furious. To Bessus dive, said the villagers of one village. Let the Iranian get away to his own country. Daiv is an evil spirit in whose existence any Persian piously believes. The satrap almost cried with resentment. Let Bess go to the other world after his kinsman Daryavush. The villagers of the other village advised. We do not care about such lords, said the inhabitants of the third village. We Bactrians will manage the affairs of Bactriana ourselves and the inhabitants of the fourth village said nothing, but treated the strangers with a cloud of arrows and killed eight docks. After unsuccessful attempts to rest in the huts of the farmers, the party came upon a vast orchard. In revenge for their humiliation, the Persians cut down dozens of apricots, plums, and cherries, and lit smoky fires. Spantamano lay on his stained cloak by the fire and sang in a low voice a song about a pot broken into three pieces. Bess, with his head down on his hands, sat motionless on the other side of the fire. He felt a fierce hatred for Spantamano. There was a direct connection between the behavior of the Sogdian and those who had done such a despicable thing to Bess today. And if Spantamano had not been surrounded by his loyal kinsmen, the Achaemenid would not have hesitated to attack the cunning descendant of Siavaksh with a knife. Did best destroy his cousin Dariabush in order that this blue-eyed youth might prevent him from becoming the ruler of Persia? And that Spantamano was trying to hinder Bess, only a blind man can see. Oh, Bess's heart feels that the sign of the ancient kings will eat him. To bend the docks to the fate of the evil Sogdian? That would be wonderful. But how can we trust the vagabonds of the Black Sands? They serve Bess, but listen to the cursed Spantamano, because he is their own, whereas Bess is a stranger, a Persian 
and how many evils did the docks suffer from the Persian conquerors? The consciousness of his own powerlessness depressed Bess, overwhelmed by contradictory feelings, but forced to control himself, he kept silent, petrified with grief. At dawn, Bess sent a messenger to Bactra and told the rest of the warriors to get ready to go. Poorly slept, pale, with wrinkled, swollen faces and disheveled hair, with hands in which suit from raw firewood in clothes that had dried overnight, Persians, Sogdians, and Daki sullenly and reluctantly put away their equipment, put on the horses, felt blankets, and tightened wide girths. After a meager breakfast, which consisted of unleavened cakes baked in ashes, the detachment headed towards Bactra. The closer the horsemen got to the town, the busier the road became. Peasants carried sheaves of last year's dry alfalfa on donkeys. Huge wheels of wagons loaded with sacks of wheat squeaked. The two humped camels of the nomads were walking steadily. No one paid attention to Bess's detachment. The war had begun long ago. The first militias returning from the west were greeted with curiosity. The warriors were surrounded by a dense crowd and questioned at length about the battles with Iskander. There was much talk conjecture and gossip. However, the war dragged on, and everyone got used to it, no matter how hard it was. It was necessary to live and to get bread, and people, having reconciled themselves to what God sends, returned to everyday affairs. If before a warrior wounded in the Battle of Issus was followed from morning till night by a crowd of gawkers, now nobody noticed him especially since there were more men wounded in various battles than healthy ones. By evening, Bess's squad, having made a double crossing, reached the suburbs of Bactra. At first, there were gray blocks and rhombuses of plowed fields with rare mulberries on the meadows, then came thick gardens. At the sides of the road, the mud-brick fences of peace and estates were already resing. Then came the houses of tanners, potters, and blacksmiths who had moved out of town because of the crowded conditions. At last, Bess reached the west gate of Old Bactra. The city stood on a hill and was surrounded by a high wall of large raw bricks. To the right and left of the gate stretched rows of narrow arrow-shaped loopholes guards stood on the rectangular towers. Bess was waiting. As soon as the squad appeared in the narrow street, a crowd of bearded riders in spacious patterned robes and striped headbands rode out of the wide open gates to meet them. The drum rumbled, the huge brass trumpets roared like buffalo, and the thin voice of the Zurna rattled and clattered. Spantamano bit his lip, but Bess's face shone with pleasure. There was not a single Bactrian in the welcoming crowd. About 5,000 Persians fleeing from the Macedonians to the east had crowded into the city. When they heard from the messenger about the arrival of Bessus, they rejoiced and rushed to meet him. Their days passed in disputes and strife. No one knew how to be, what to do, because they lacked a leader. And so the leader appeared. The troops stopped. The gray-haired Persian from the meeting slowly got off his horse and strode to Bessus. Three steps before he reached him, he fell to the road and put his lips to the ground. Bess was transformed. His eyes shone proudly. He became Achaemenid Bess again, satrap of Bactra and Sogdiana, and now no one asked who he was. The old man took out a fur of wine from behind his back, filled a golden cup to the brim with dark moisture, and presented it to Bess with his right hand while putting his left hand to his heart. Bess parted his weathered lips in a stern smile, 
took the cup in both palms and brought it to his mouth. He drank readily, but took his time, savoring the tart wine with dignity. When he had drained the cup, he dipped his index finger in the remaining drop and drew a wet pink streak across his forehead. A battle cry rang out from the rough throats of the Persian warriors. The gray-haired Iranian took Bess's horse under the reins and led it behind him. Bess slouched and arched his long neck like a snowy vulture. The Persians parted, letting their lord and his Iranian's companions go forward, then closed in behind them in a tight crowd, bristling with spears, and followed the satrap into the city. Spantamano did not move from his seat. The Sogdians and Dahi remained near the descendant of Siavaksh. Bess seemed to have forgotten his associate. But as Spantamano realized, it only seemed so. Bess had something on his mind. He was to be feared. The pot was tormented by longing. It broke into three pieces, said Spantamano and turned to the warriors. Have you seen it? When there is a fire in the thicket and the animals are fleeing from the fire, the wolf and the deer run side by side and no one touches anyone. But the fire is over and the wolf sinks his teeth into the deer again. Do you understand me? Yes. You Dahi, where are you going? The Dahi are on their way, talking among themselves. Serving Bess, who was not allowed to sleep even in his own fiefdom, promised little good for the Dahi. It would be better to go under Spantamano. They were convinced that Bess himself was afraid of him. So the elders of the Da's answered without hesitation, We are with you, O holy meaning. The name Spantamano meant holy sense. The descendant of Siavaksh nodded his head in satisfaction and looked at the thin, pale Persian who remained at the gate, the same Persian who had been present at the murder of Darius. He lowered his head and stared sadly into the void. Dadafarn, Spantamano called out to him. The man woke up. Why did you stay here? Where would I go? Dadafarn smiled sadly. To Bess's. Dadafarn shook his head slowly. No, Spantamano. I want to go to you. Spantamano looked at the Persian with a testing look. Could Bess have sent him on purpose? No, it couldn't be. It was not the first time Spantamano had seen this poor Dadafarn, but he did say it. What if I don't let him in? Dadafarn immediately became dejected and mumbled confusedly. Then... I don't know. Fool, said Spantamano, scolding himself. He felt sorry for Dadafarn. He's sick enough as it is, and you're tormenting him. All right, Spantamano nodded good-naturedly. You don't take offense, I was just saying that. I'm glad you decided to stay with me. Dadafarn perked up. Spantamano turned to the Dawes and the Sogdians. The Persians have gone left, toward the castle. We will move to the right, towards my friend Vakshunvarta. Are we all agreed? Yes. Dear ladies and gentlemen, for the continuation of the story of Sogdiana, see the next episode. Leave feedback, write comments, and share this video with your friends. Voiced and translated into English by Vyacheslav Orlov. Peace, kindness, and love to you and your family.